So we started, we were just sitting over there, yeah, thinking should we here. start, and you were all ready, and we were all ready. So Why let's not? start. So, hi, my name's Amy. I'm Fletcher. <laughs> Thank you. That's all we got. Uh, so welcome uh, to everyone to the um, regional tour of Sunday Assembly <laughs> in which we <laughs> visit a cornucopia of spots in the Hollywood, West Hollywood and surrounding areas. Uh, thank you everyone for keeping up with us and joining us today. Uh, Sunday Assembly Los Angeles is a God-free community that celebrates a worldview grounded in evidence and reason. We invite everyone here to join us uh, to say it with us, live better, help often, often and, and wonder, wonder more. more. Uh, today, we will hear from Craig Stark about how video games are uh, changing our brains, for better or worse. Find out soon. And our program here is going to be uh, about an hour long. You're welcome afterwards to hang out and chat with us a little while, or you can hang out in the lobby and have a coffee or something. Uh, but we're going to start with a couple of songs from Ground Control. This first one, Yari over there, is going to be our Billy Idol. And... <laughs> There's a bit of call and response involved in this one. So he's going to say, yeah, and you've got to say, yeah. yeah. So let's just have a quick rehearsal of this. Yeah? Yeah! Very good. Yeah. 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 yeah! 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 On your feet, this is Moni Moni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's on? Warblers. Let's do this. All right. Check. Is this on? Check, check. Do you guys remember last month I was talking about Katie being sick? You don't need no this is Katie, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's been healed without any prayer. I think we're going to be praying. Right? Okay. It's your prayer. We appreciate it. That's better. Okay. Yeah, this song traditionally might have some profanity, but I'm not singing that. Kids. So. <laughs> Real good? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Hey! Oh, right. <coughs> Here she comes now, say my name, my name.
one second. <laughs> so this is a, well, I don't know. This is a, an 80, a 90s song, I guess. Uh, sorry, I'm not very good at obfuscating a drip. I'm supposed to be uh, tell it, getting, dr directing your attention away from the fact that we're switching yeah. around here. And I'm doing a really poor job of it, but it's a sort of uh, part and parcel for me here. Anyway, I'm also supposed to be switching channels here that if you're really interested in hearing about that too. <laughs> issues. It's nice to be back. Yeah. If, anyone, if anyone wants to see photos, come and see me. Uh, my, my face basically fell off. It was awesome. I looked like I had like a really bad chemical peel, um, but now I'm a lot better. All right, so here's some 90s uh, grunge for you.
toiletries today for the kids at Safe Place for Youth. Uh, we're doing another project with them actually. On the 29th we will be preparing and serving dinner. Uh, if you'd like to come by and help with that either the night before or the day of, uh, that would be great. And the next assembly we will be accepting gently used clothing uh, as an item drive and for Safe Place for Youth again. So thank you. Uh, so, uh, and you're going to read out a few um, of um, sharing moments. Is I would right? love that, but I don't have any. So as you were coming oh. in today, uh, a volunteer might have asked you if you had any milestones, any ups and downs you wanted to share. And uh, if someone did not, why don't we share some right now? Uh, yeah. I could, I could probably start. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, milestones. Uh, we got a new venue, and Yay. then we lost it. And then we got another new venue for Sunday Assembly. That was great. <laughs> How about, how about you, Fletch? Anything going on with you? Uh, no, not, nothing exciting. <laughs> just started a uh, new week at school, new year at school, and uh, it's kind of fun being back at work a little bit. I don't like sitting around the house, enjoying myself, eating food and watching TV. Yeah, no, I'd much serious. rather yeah. be grading students' works because yeah, I really yeah. care about the kids. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything to share? We're in a nice, close space, so I don't think we even need a mic. But uh, mic's right yeah. over here. I mean, actually, I, I think we could probably hear anyway. So yeah, if you want to just mic. speak where you are. I like microphones. Okay. okay. And we can feel important. <laughs> uh, I'm just wrapping up the score to the first short film I've ever composed for. Whoa. Thank you very much. <laughs> Big life dream of mine, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited to share it with you guys here when we can. So Excellent. Yeah. Sounds great. All right, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Has anybody else got anything they'd like to share? Oh, yes, Maria. Hey, I had uh, two big boys went back to uh, college this month, so our bank account is hemorrhaging, but they're both uh, really happy and uh, where they should be, and we have an empty house. Yay. Excellent. Yay. Yay. I, like, I, like. I guess I can look forward to that. Our boys just started uh, preschool, and our bank accounts are hemorrhaging. It seems like <laughs> we've got a long road ahead. Um, I'm, I'm doing this on behalf of my husband, who is, is um, oh behind yeah. the curtain. <laughs> uh, he's one of the tech guys. Um, he just had surgery. He has, um, uh, we call him James 2.0. He had a uh, disc replaced. So, yes. So if you see a man carrying an iPad with a very lovely <laughs> gouge, that's James. <laughs> so and yeah. we should go up and give him a big hug, I guess. Yes, that's shake him. Shake him hard. You know, <laughs> just... Put, move his head back and forth <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Meredith. Anybody else? It's like my favorite part of the assembly. Uh, I got one. So after a lifetime of just uh, dealing with all sorts of issues, I decided to start th therapy three weeks ago. And, and what we've discovered so far is that it is a jumble of just, it's a mess it's a in mess. there. <laughs> it's all right, though. We're, we're working on it. All, all, we can, all we can say is, <laughs> finally. It's finally. <laughs> okay. I just finally took the step of registering a domain for my car seat installation business. Woo! Hey! <laughs> well, why don't you just tell us what it is? It's it's monocarseats.com. Cool. Monocarseats, that's clever. Because I'm Monica, okay. if you don't know that, and yeah. they're car seats, yeah. so... Who are you pointing It was his idea. With the oh. CA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm concerned about the extreme lack of environmental regulations at my gym, and I have a petition I'm trying to get signed to get electric vehicle charging stations installed, and also signs that say, basically, stop this obnoxious macho jock engine revving. It's in an enclosed <laughs> building. It's 
really loud, it's very annoying, and it is toxic to the air. I just read a, the World Health Organization reports that about 7 million people in the world are dying premature deaths because of, you know, climate change and, and all that stuff. Anyway, thank okay. you for your letting us know. Thank you. Oh, sorry, yep. Okay, so I just got a text from my wife who's over there who's like, you didn't want to mention our anniversaries tomorrow? Oh! <laughs> uh -huh. What the fuck, Steve? <laughs> and so not only did you not mention it, but you're sitting on the opposite side <laughs> of the room. Okay. So he doesn't get hit when he doesn't mention it. <laughs> and we have one more at the back. All right, so uh, l two weeks ago, or last week, uh, I, our, our group at JPL uh, just got a new postdoc scientist, and she's the first person that I'll be mentoring. She's basically an apprentice, and I'm realizing very quickly that I have no idea what I'm doing or how <laughs> to give <laughs> good advice or, or really any kind of significant guidance to someone whose career depends a little bit on what I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Hey guys, how's it going? So uh, I just survived until my uh, senior year of high school. I think that's a pretty big accomplishment. Yes! You know, like half of the 18 year olds are already dropped out, so. Yikes. Nice. <laughs> Good job. have to care about anything again. It's a bit hard to see if there are hands up. Are there any more hands up there anywhere? I don't know what Miles feels, but I feel panicked. Go ahead. Try not to stand right in front of each other. Like right behind them? So I should stay between you and the, keep the pillar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, cool. <laughs> we'll, we'll just, I was we'll just going to say that only works from one angle, doesn't it? Keep moving. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Just, we'll lay uh, down on the floor. just before we move on there, were there any other points that people wanted to make? Oh, one more. Yeah. One more. yeah. So uh, a while ago, I was uh, pretty like anorexic, and I managed to gain 15 pounds of muscle in under yeah. uh, hey, 30 good days. Job. Good job. I, I just like to add to that. I'm not anorexic, but I also gained 15 pounds. So uh, we both got yeah. something that we can we can feel good about. Compare notes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing. Uh, it is now time for our Sunday Assembly Kids Breakout. So if you brought a child or you are a child and you're not already in the kids' room uh, doing fun-filled, science-oriented activities, you can meet Meredith <coughs> right here and she'll walk you over to where our, our fine child care providers will entertain you. Uh, and uh, Sam, you can't go. You're running the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> every, every time he tries it. All right, so uh, for the next couple of minutes, we thought we'd like to give you a chance just to say uh, hello to some of the people around you. And if you need a little um, prompt, we thought this week's prompt, and it's related to the speech later, would be about games. So if you're not sure what to say to somebody behind you, beside you, that you don't know, um, you can ask them, what was your favorite game when you were a child? So I'm going to now try this on Amy. So Amy, what was your favorite game when you were a child? Yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed to say it now, but I liked uh, Candyland before I realized it wasn't a game. Candyland? And, and Codenames. I love that game. Codenames. So tell me, tell me, Amy, when was the last time you played Codenames? Why, uh, Fletcher, I believe it was Sunday night at Sunday Assembly game night at my house. Oh, <laughs> so, so Amy, when will the next Sunday Assembly game night Funny be? Funny you should ask me that. Uh, September 29th uh, on Saturday night, we're having one in Venice at my place at 8.30, and code names will be there, but I'm sorry, not Candyland. <laughs> 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 All right, so for the next minute or two. Turn to your neighbor, somebody you don't know, just say hello to them, and if you're not sure what to talk about, why not ask them what was their favorite game? Over to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this way, please. If you can Thank hear you. me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap a bunch of times. It's, it's funny because we do that at school, and I thought, shall I do that? I thought, that's patronizing them. But then you did it. Good I for don't you. Mind. Um, 
<laughs> Some of you may have come to our inaugural uh, meeting over on the West Side Assembly, which we had a little while back. And as part of the creative space at that, we had a guest who just brought the house down. She was very, very funny. She's spoken before at the Laugh Factory, the Comedy Store, Broke LA. Recently, she was performing in Berlin. So could you please give a warm welcome to Rachel Friedland. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'll try to remember to not stand in front of the pole. Uh, <laughs> someone was talking about, during the uh, achievements, announcements, uh, the horrific bro culture that is taking over the gym, and I'd also like to speak on that. Uh, I've also started going to the gym. You can compliment me on my arms later. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've noticed at the gym there's a lot of guys who will sit around me and just grunt. A lot, you know, it's just a lot of like, <laughs> And um, in order to keep up with that, I've, st I've decided that whenever I walk into the gym, I'll just start screaming immediately. You know, I'll just walk in like, ah! <laughs> and that's my, uh, that's my power move. That's how I've gotten <laughs> these guns. Thank you very much. More questions later, more compliments later. Guys, growing up, I was so excited to get boobs because uh, my mom has big boobs. We're going to jump right into this. Um, <laughs> it's dark <laughs> enough in here. Uh, I was so excited to get boobs because my mom has big boobs, and I was like, those are coming to me. So every day that I was 13, I would run to the bathroom and be like, one day these kernels are going to pop, <laughs> <laughs> and my boobs will just be here. And I thought that every day until my mom sat me down and was like, Rachel, you will never have big boobs because mine are fake. <laughs> And I cried. I cried. <laughs> I cried. So I cried to this day. I was so upset. And she was like, honey, don't worry about it. You know, we could always buy you some. And I thought about it. And I was like, if I wait just a little bit longer, will I get dad's boobs instead? <laughs> Are they coming from his side of the family? As you can guess, I do have a hot mom. Uh, it's fine having, yeah, sh <laughs> she'd love to hear that. Um, it's fine having a hot mom until people try to hit on the both of us. And they're like, well, what's happening here? Are you guys sisters? It's like, you don't need to neg me to get to her. Just go for it. You know? <laughs> I already don't want to be here. <sighs> I've also got a pretty smoking hot grandma. Thank you very much. She's 98 years old and banging. <laughs> uh, no, she is pretty old. Um, in my... <laughs> In my grandma's old age, she's become a little bit of a movie critic. She saw one movie last year. It was Dunkirk. Uh, and my grandma's review of Dunkirk was, it's not how I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't argue her on that one. Like, <laughs> What are we going to do? She likes to tell me all the things that we have in common. I think she thinks it'll keep her around longer. And like one time, she was like, we're so in common that, you know, I also didn't know how to boil water until I was 23. I was like, is this a roast? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you zinging me, Grandma? <laughs> Lately, though, she's been like, Rachel, our fingernails are shaped the exact same way. We have the exact same shaped fingernails. I'm like, that is so cool. I share a Coke nail with my grandma. <laughs> 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 Living history, you guys. It's so fun. She's, uh, she's trying to get me to watch Fiddler on the Roof. She's been trying to get me to watch Fiddler on the Roof for like five years. Uh, she's like, Rachel, you've got to understand your roots. You need to know where you come from. You have to watch Fiddler on the Roof. And I'm like, Grandma, I see homeless people singing all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> I get it. You know? I get it. I've also got a pretty eccentric dad. He used to rock one diamond stud earring for 20 years. That was his accessory of choice. Until after his third marriage, and he swapped it out for a simple silver hoop. And the whole family was like, oh, shit, Scott's in a crisis. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> he really was. Uh, everyone was like, hey, man, do you need a hug? And it turns out he just needed to get married for a fourth time. So he went, <laughs> he did that. I actually found out my dad was engaged for the fourth time on Instagram. Did anybody else? <laughs> no? It's so funny, people are so concerned of like, what are millennials doing on the internet? What are millennials going to do next on the internet? But what is my dad doing on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying. 
All my friends were like, are you going to go watch your dad get married for a fourth time? But it's kind of like when a movie comes out with too many sequels. And you're like, I already know how that one's going to end. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to go. We didn't need a Pitch Perfect 3. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I did go see Pitch Perfect 3. I did go see it. <laughs> I did go see that. I've just come to accept the fact that if my dad died doing what he loved, he'd be saying, I do, as his coffin's being lowered into the ground. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Bless him. He likes to talk about his fourth wife. Whenever he talks about her, he's like, hey, don't worry, fourth and final. <laughs> and we're like, well, she's not a slice of pizza, so yeah, I hope <laughs> it is your fourth and final. <laughs> I don't know. It's so silly. Uh, he's, um, he's such an interesting guy. He's made me, like... He has made me realize that um, a lot, like a lot of my friends, are. Let's not talk about that quite yet. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing about my dad being married four times. It makes it sound like he's very good at doing this. You know what I mean? It makes it sound like he's really good with women. Maybe even that he's suave. But my dad is actually the guy who walks up to women and is like, "Well, what's going on here? Are you guys sisters?" <laughs> <laughs> it's not good, Scott. <laughs> it's not good. I have a lot of Facebook friends who are finally getting proposed to. I'm kind of at that age where everyone's finally getting proposed to. They're posting a lot of stuff like, he finally popped the question. My boyfriend finally asked, which feels so passive aggressive to me. Because the only thing I want my boyfriend to finally do is the dishes. You know <laughs> what I mean? I just hope one day I can post, he finally took out the recycling. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I just feel like if you want to find someone who will propose to you sooner, go find that person. There are plenty of people who want to propose to you. My dad will propose to you. <laughs> <laughs> My dad will propose to you in three years maximum. That is a Friedland guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling it out right now. If anyone here wants to be proposed to, please come find me after this set. I am starting a sign-up sheet. My dad will propose to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> can make it happen for you. Uh, I am uh, I'm in a relationship myself. <sighs> Hold the applause. <laughs> uh, no, I've, I, uh, I met my boyfriend on Tinder. We've been dating for three years, which is kind of crazy. It's so insane to, to like meet someone off Tinder because it kind of feels like I've won the lottery. But at this point, I could use the money instead. <laughs> I would love to swap it out. It is, it's nice to finally be in a relationship because um, dating in LA is terrible. Have you heard about it? Uh, I like, I just remember that I went on a date with a guy and as I went to park, he was like, oh, whoa, you can parallel park, that's hot. <laughs> and I was like, mm, just wait till you see all the words I can read and write. <laughs> I'm gonna blow your mind. I don't know, when I first met my boyfriend, I learned that he was in a punk band, and I was like, well, they can't all be pure winners, but that's fine. I don't know, like, I, I've come to accept it, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I thought I was done having to pretend to like Blink-182, is what I'm saying, <laughs> but the 90s are back, you know what I mean? So, like, let's get into it. Whenever he has a practice, a band practice, I'm like, don't forget your girlfriend fucking hates you, and go get him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> go have fun with that one. No, I don't know. I don't know that like we'd ever get married, really, because uh, my dad's taken all the themes. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I also I don't know that he's the one, but I do think that he could be my first ex-husband. You know, <laughs> and I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I'll leave you with one last anecdote. I had to buy a helmet um, for someone else the other week, and I called the store, and the guy goes, "Let me guess, this isn't for you." And I said, "No, it's not." And he goes, "Do you want to know how I know that?" I was like, I don't know, because I'm a woman? <laughs> and he's like, no, that is not what I meant. I am so sorry. I just meant I could hear the, the worry in your voice. And I was like, okay, because I'm a woman? Or <laughs> what are we talking about? Oh, well, you guys didn't like that. And that's okay. That's <laughs> my time. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah, Rachel Friedland, everyone. Woo! So, yes. Uh, so he is a professor for the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the University of California, Irvine. His work has appeared in over 60 peer-reviewed publications, not to mention on NPR's Science Friday and All Things Considered. Uh, it is his fourth time speaking at Sunday Assembly, which <laughs> makes him the speakingest speaker that we have ever had. And at this point, I usually make a weak joke about Iron Man uh, and uh, the Lord of Winterfell. Please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Craig Stark.
Well, thank you. And yeah, it is my it is my fourth time. And hopefully, you know, one of these times I'm going to get it right. Thank you for letting me keep coming back over and over again to practice here. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you about today is ways in which you can change your brain. I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I try to figure out actually how memory works in the brain. That's really what I do. Uh, just to show you that, yes, I have a brain, so I'm qualified to tell you, whoops, tell you about these things. Uh, that is my brain over there, right there. I have one. I took it out for you a little bit earlier. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about how your brain works, and really what it's going to come down to is how experiences you have shape your brain. And they can come from computer games, but they can come from a lot of other places as well. So one of the big things to know, look, your brain is full of a whole bunch of neurons. They're talking to each other in this massive complex structure. And all of what you're thinking, all of what you're feeling, all of this comes down to that delicate balance of activity bouncing back and forth between these neurons. But that delicate balance is constantly in flux. It's always changing. Every experience you have changes your brain. Being here right now changes your brain as neurons sort of reach out to make connections with other neurons. And we think about learning in the brain. A lot of times when we think about learning and this kind of thing, the image that comes to mind is something like this. You know, a classroom. You have kids, they're soaking up the knowledge, their brains are being formed, and that's true, and that's awesome. It's great. Their brains are changing. But it's not just things like that. When you take something like you read a good book, that's changed your brain. Look, when you say it's, it's changed your outlook on life, it changed you in some way. That's not happening in your big toe. It's your brain that has been rewired. And so everything like that, but it's not just things that are clear sort of learning experiences. You know, if you have some nice hands-on demo or you're giving that demo or you do something like, well, you go on a trip. You remember that trip. That trip has changed you. It has actually altered your brain. And certainly if you come to some sort of event, you have an enriching experience, something like here at Sunday Assembly, you can actually have this change your brain. So, but the big point here is that every new experience you have is actually rewiring your brain. Nine hasn't been rewired enough to remember which one is the laser pointer and which one's the advancer. <laughs> anyway, so that's why I brought a separate laser pointer with me so I can <laughs> tag team here. Anyway, so when we study this kind of thing in rodents, there's an incredible phenomenon called environmental enrichment. If you take a mouse or a rat and you put them in a box, a typical little like mouse box like this, we call that in a standard environment. You can test their memory. You can do all sorts of things. This is how mice actually spend a lot of their days. Now, before you think that's really boring, it is kind of boring, but at the same time, they're not being eaten, and so overall, it's not necessarily a horrible life for these mice. Well, give them a couple months. Um, but then also, mice can go and be raised in this thing called an enriched environment. And the amazing thing of just giving them some more space, some things to run around and explore and do, is it has incredible effects on their brain. One of the things that it does is it brings new neurons into a spot in the brain called your hippocampus. And your hippocampus, if you've ever seen any like documentary on memory or anything like this, your hippocampus is that structure that we know is critically important for memory. And one of the amazing things is, is if you give rats this kind of environment, they get new neurons born into their hippocampus, they get a lot more of them. And what's even more cool about this is the more a rat goes or a mouse goes and explores its environment, the more that it actually does, the more of these new neurons get inside its brain in particular, as I say, in this spot called the hippocampus. So let's meet the hippocampus. Let's see where it is. I actually, I brought one with me, and I keep, why well, I keep doing this is because I'm like, I had a hippocampus here in my pocket somewhere. Uh, I'll just have to show you the one on the screen here. This is, you may guess, as to who this is. There's that profile. Um, and now if we were to go spin my head around and see that I've gained a couple pounds up there too. But in any case, we slice to this beautiful mid-sagittal slice and come back a little. There's a little structure right there, and that structure is the hippocampus. And if you take this out of the brain, it looks something like this. That's what a hippocampus looks like. And you may have noticed I have these little seahorses on my slides, because when you look at that, you say, oh my gosh, that's a seahorse. See? OK, you can kind of munge it on there, and that's sort of a seahorse. <laughs> look, if you just study at brain slices and everything and all, all day, and you're some anatomist or whatever, and that's the only thing you do, maybe you get bored and you say that, OK, I'll get a little creative, and that's a hippocampus. But we know that the hippocampus is involved in all sorts of kinds of memory, specifically memory for things like events. So if you remember anything from my talk today or from anything else that's been happening today, your hippocampus was required to let you actually do that. 
Remember the details of things. That's your hippocampus. All right. So that's the hippocampus. We know it's involved in memory. We know if you stick mice in an enriching kind of environment, it does great things for their hippocampus. And that's all fine and cool if you're a mouse. And we're not mice. And so one of the questions that my lab has been trying to figure out is, does this happen to us? If we give ourselves enriching experiences, does this change our brain? Does it change our hippocampus the way it does for the mice? Because it would be really cool if it did. I mean, but look, remember that whole mouse experiment? You're talking about mice living like a couple of them in a little box versus maybe a more natural environment. We already live enriched lives, so maybe it doesn't actually happen. Maybe it's already going on in us, and there's nothing more that we can actually do. That's an open question. As a scientist, we love open questions. So my lab set out to try to figure out, can we do this? But this isn't my lab. I don't have like these big habit trail kind of things uh, in which I can have people wander around. This is actually uh, epic uh, rock sky tours uh, in uh, Colorado. So if you go there and you're not afraid of heights, uh, go have fun with that. I would be staying on the ground. Uh, this is much more of what my lab looks like. Uh, uh, people sitting in front of computers doing tests involving like memory by just staring at them. Um, by the way, a couple of you may recognize this guy. Anybody recognize him? Who? Vsauce, yes. So that is Michael Stevens of Vsauce. There was a whole episode, season two of Minefield on YouTube Red. Um, you can watch the trailer, or if you don't have YouTube Red, you can do the demo for a little while for free. And you can see all sorts of great things on that. He came and he did a fantastic uh, special on, on this stuff. So that's what my lab actually looks like. Uh, and so I'm gonna be talking about how playing games and doing computer-based training can actually change your brain. And I wanna make one quick disclaimer. When you hear about computer-based video games, train your brain and brain games, makes your brain better and all of this kind of stuff out there, that's not what I'm talking about. Most of those games, I'm sorry, they're kind of boring. They honestly really are. If you ever try them, you'll see things like this. It's like, oh, ready to play? Look at this little thing. And remember, there's a D up here, and now there's an M. And hey, a D came up again in the upper left, and you should say yes, because that was the same thing that happened two spaces ago. <sighs> I can't do that for very long. I'm going to get bored. I mean, it does do all sorts of things. You can actually see that in, if you pray, play these games, you get better at doing them, and your capacity gets better. This is some work from another UCI researcher, Susan Yaki. Um, but that's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about game games. Actual things like computer games where you have huge budgets to make these incredibly rich, engaging worlds. Does playing them have an effect on you? And of course, people talk about things like, oh, if you do something like this, you're going to go and have issues shooting up people or something like that because you can't separate. And honestly, the research says that's not really the case. But I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, can we use games here as a way to give people enriching experiences. Because these worlds are massive. They're huge, they're engaging. You get involved in the story. Does this have an effect like those mice living in enriched environments? And the answer is actually, yeah. So if anybody was here about a year and a half or so ago when I gave a talk, I, I showed this slide and a couple of the others here and I'm gonna give you an update as to what we've been seeing on this. So if I give people a memory test in which they saw a bunch of objects like maybe including this seahorse, Later on, I can test their memory and say, how well do you really remember this? Do you just remember that you saw some objects? Do you also remember I showed you a seahorse? Or is your memory rich and detailed enough to know that it was this seahorse and not this one that I showed you? That's the kind of thing we know that this hippocampus is involved in. And in mice, it's that sort of memory for details we know gets better. And it turns out, if you take people who don't play games or play people who play simple like 2D games, your candy crushes and that kind of thing, and they do about the same on this memory test, there's no different, but people who are playing these richer, more involved games do better on my memory test that has nothing to do with Destiny or GTA or anything like that, it's the memory for this. So that's pretty cool, but there are a lot of things that again, as a scientist, as a skeptic, we have to say, oh, come on, maybe these are just like the cooler, smarter people, and these are kind of the idiots. It could be that, and as a scientist, we need to figure that sort of thing out, and so we need to see, can we move it ourselves to actually believe it? So this is the, uh, the study I presented last time. I took college undergraduates who were non-gamers, which did mean that it was about three quarters women. There was that gender bias in there. I'll put that out there. Um, but I brought them into the lab, and I gave them the memory test. Then we had them play 
For example, Angry Birds here, a simple 2D kind of game. It's addictive, it's fun, it's engaging, but you're launching birds to go knock over pigs, and it's not really that engaging and enriching an experience. We had them play that for two weeks, or we had them play Super Mario 3D World for two weeks. I wanted a nice game that, I mean, look, kids play this game, and I'm not going to get in trouble with my review board for having them play this. You know, you land on top of a mushroom or something like that. There isn't a mushroom lobby that's keeping them. Uh... <laughs> anyway, so you do that kind of thing. We test them before, we test them after. We also have a group that's not doing anything, and the Angry Birds and the No Game Control did absolutely nothing on my memory test for these details. But sure enough, that group who played Super Mario 3D World for two weeks got better. And after they stopped playing, they started to maybe slide down a little, but not too bad. This is two weeks of playing a half hour a day, and their memory got better. Perfectly consistent. But this does bring up a bunch of questions. And again, good scientist skeptics, we love questions like, really, are you sure? I mean, seriously, come on. They played Super Mario 3D World for two weeks. Are you sure this wasn't just a fluke? And if it's not a fluke, what the heck is it about the game that's doing that? Is it because you're controlling plumbers? Is that it? I mean, what is it about this game that's actually causing this? And does it work in anything other than college undergraduates? We know our memory for these exact details, this kind of memory in the hippocampus changes with age. Could we use an experience like playing these immersive 3D video games to help offset age-related changes in memory? Well, that would be cool. And then finally here, is this actually changing the brain? So let me try to knock these kind of things off here. So first off, we said, all right, that was pretty cool, but you've probably heard a little bit in the news about the replications crisis in science and all the kinds of things where, are these things really real or did they just grab headlines? So the first thing as a good scientist you should do is just try to say, can I do it again? And okay, we said, can we do it again and can we extend it into older adults? So we took 60 to 80 year olds and we did the same thing. Brought them in, gave them the test, that's the before here, and we assigned them either to the Super Mario 3D World group, again, it was nice that we didn't have like Grand Theft Auto or something, you know, getting an 80 year old to be like, I'm gonna pop a cap in, no, okay, let's not do that. Or we had them play Angry Birds, or they played Solitaire on their computer as a control, and the Solitaire computer uh, on their own computer did absolutely nothing. This is two weeks, four weeks, and then after the delay. But the groups that certainly did Angry Birds, that's this right up here, they got better. And actually also the uh, group that played Angry Birds got a little bit better as well. But remember, these are like 70 year olds and we're showing up to their house with a big flat screen TV, you know, Wii U, this may be an enriching, engaging experience to begin with. And then when we took a look at the brain scans, we could actually see that their hippocampus, this Super Mario group, their hippocampus got a little bit bigger. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> so it seems as if we're actually changing the brain as we're doing this. We're seeing some connectivity changes as well. But this doesn't get at the question of what is it about this? You use the same games over and over again. They've got to try to branch out and understand, is it that they're exploring space? Or is it that they're just being engaged in something new, giving their brain something to learn, something to figure out? And by the way, that seems to be what it is. It's giving yourself something to learn and something to figure out that actually is what's changing your brain. The enrichment seems to be driven by that novelty. And here's one way that we're seeing that. We took Minecraft. Okay, I mean, some of you have played it, kids have played it, grandkids have played it. It's a really nice open world game, which we can control. So we had four different groups. One group, we gave them a magic box full of everything. Any kind of material you would want is in the box. Go do whatever you feel like. And we told them to play for a half hour a day for two weeks, and we uh, uh, saw what they did. Turns out, by the way, that when you just tell people do whatever you want, it's sort of like the box of Legos. You know, you have the instructions, you build that one thing, and then you're like, maybe I'll build a tower, and I'll knock it over. <laughs> maybe I'll build a taller tower. And you kind of get stuck in a little bit of that same sort of rut often. So we had another group that we said, all right, by the way, here are a whole bunch of things that you could build, and we'll teach you how to build them. So maybe you do a simple thing, and then you get a more complex thing, and a more complex thing, and eventually you're building an ADAT walker, and that's pretty darn cool. And it takes a lot to actually do that. You have to sculpt the ground to be able to get up that high and all sorts of stuff that you're constantly engaging yourself to be able to do. We had a third group here that was pure exploration. Just here is the world. If you notice this world has stuff, these things don't. Here is the world, go explore, go play Minecraft, go have fun. And then we had a final group in which we did this exploration for one week and then we did this building for another week. So we kind of stacked the novelty on top of the novelty. Here's what we found. This group here, eh, absolutely nothing. Okay, 
But again, they really didn't do all that much in the world. They learned it a little bit, and they did something, and then they built towers and knocked them over, that kind of level of uh, stuff that they did. The uh, directed building and the pure exploration groups, their memory got better, and better by that same exact amount that we keep seeing over and over and over again. This 0.1 boost in our little memory score, which, by the way, is about 25 years' worth of cognitive decline. That's a real boost in memory. Yeah, so if you went from 40 to 65, and you're saying, it's like, yeah, my memory's not quite as good as it was back when I was younger. Um, yeah, that kind of level is what we've actually been able to restore. But then this group that really sort of got a double dose of novelty, first you're going to learn to explore, and then you're going to go and start building things. And by the way, we're not giving you any magic boxes. You have to go and find those things to go and build stuff. They got even better still. And what we've been able to see in all this, I'll just give you a quick little snippet of some of it, is that the, here's a one person who didn't explore very much, and here's a person who explored a lot. What this is doing is it's actually plotting where they went in the whole world. And no, that's not my hand jiggering. I'm trying to actually follow a little trace there. <laughs> all right, so the more that they did that, the more complexity they had in their exploration, regardless of the group they were in. Here are four different groups. That's what actually improved their memory behavior. And we see a similar thing with the complexity of how much they actually build. How much are you engaging yourself in something new? So, was it a fluke? It doesn't seem to be. We've now seen it five out of five times we've tested it. In terms of the game, what is it? It's about giving yourself new stuff to learn. And the great thing about these complex video games is there's constantly new stuff to learn and figure out. Even as you're just walking around in this world, there's stuff for you to learn and figure out. Does it work in anything other than college undergraduates? Yeah, we did it in 60 to 80 year olds and showed the same exact boost and it worked perfectly in Michael Stevens too. And it does seem as if this is actually changing the structure of the brain. So as a take home message in terms of what you should be doing on all this kind of thing, games are great. I can hand you a controller, get you a game, and you can have an enriching experience. You can explore this massive world with all of the stuff inside there to learn and figure out and do. And that's pretty darn incredible. Even if you're not very mobile, I can give you a controller and you can actually do that and have this incredibly enriching experience. So we certainly shouldn't like give a hard time for games for what they're actually doing. But that's just one way that you can actually get this kind of enrichment. If it really is true that it's this environmental enrichment, what it means is that you should engage in new things and you should be engaged in what you do. Take that level, take it to that next step and be engaged and give yourself that novelty. And it can come from a game, it can come from reading a good book or from maybe even having a group here that covers that book. It can come from giving the talk. It can come also from listening to a new talk. It can come from being one of the students or deciding that you're going to help tutor some students. It can come from having social time with friends and learning new games at game night. It can come from social activities, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, I just ripped these off of your Facebook page. <laughs> so no copyright issues on there to worry about. But that really is the take home message. It's novelty. Your brain was designed to learn and to figure things out about this world. Feed it that. Do new things. Be engaged in a lot of new things and be engaged in what you're actually doing. Thank you very much. So, band, if you want to get into position, thank you, Craig Stark, for a fascinating talk. I'll just draw your attention to the fact, have you noticed how often really smart people are bold? I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> just. We've got a special treat for you now. You might recognize uh, Steve on the guitar behind us, who uh, normally is behind the soundboard. But in his real life, he's an international rock star. And so for to today, he's going to be presenting an original song called The Swamp. So this is Ground Control with Steve Watkins. Thanks very much. Also just wanted to say thank you to Ground Control for learning this song and playing with, with me. It's great. Aww. We love you, Steve. <laughs> All right. Yeah, these seem a little quiet. Especially in there. Hey, that's getting a little better. Can you get any more in the monitors? Chick, 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 chick. A la la la. Okay. Chick, chick, chick. All right, here we go. Worst 
that you can say about nothing. Well, nothing ever leaves you alone. But two people talking to someone. Well, neither of them really knows. The box is breaking. The hearts are quaking. And now the box rolling in the ice. Flies are stuck to the stool. The lights and there's no rain that makes it. Everybody thinks it's a fool. Nobody wants to stay here. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to go home. Oh, oh, oh. friend of ours and our host uh, host of our monthly poker night. Take it away, Steve. Uh, 
Uh, I spent the last two years uh, binge reading about 25 self-help and psychology books in an effort to uh, improve my happiness. Uh, this started two years ago when I realized that I wasn't living the life that I wanted. I was a decade out of film school and I hadn't even come close to selling a script. It had become painfully obvious that my day job of an accountant had become my career. Uh, most of my friends were having kids, which left them without any time to see me. Uh, and uh, I was spending most of my time sitting around watching random crap on TV, trying to distract myself from thinking about how I really hadn't achieved much with my life. Uh, I knew that my happiness was on a downward trajectory, uh, and there wasn't any better life fairy that was going to come and improve anything, and it was up to me, but I didn't really know how to uh, improve anything myself. Uh, then one day, I was reading a book about psychology just because I like to read random interesting stuff when I realized that uh, what I was reading wasn't just trivia about how minds work, but it was actually about how my mind works, and it was information that I could use. Uh, so I started reading more psychology books and pulling... Uh, actionable, actionable information from these on ways that I could uh, improve my life. And then I branched out from this into explicit self-help books. Uh, I wasn't the first person to want to improve my life, and I didn't need to figure everything out on my own. Uh, so what did I learn from this? The first thing I learned is that well, the universe in physics operates according to logic, uh, the human mind doesn't. Uh, so instead of uh, assuming that uh, my mind would be logical or trying to force myself to be logical, uh, I should understand the way that my mind actually works and try to improve my happiness within that framework. Uh, the biggest consequence of this was realizing that my unhappiness wasn't coming from my failure as a screenwriter and the solution wasn't, or the only solution wasn't to sell a script. Uh, rather, there were uh, chemical attitude and lifestyle issues that could be uh, fixed with a series of incremental changes. Uh, now, the way to make changes is through building sustainable habits. And the key word there is sustainable, which means something that I'm willing to keep up for the rest of my life. Uh, which meant it had to be something that was either easy, small, enjoyable, uh, offered immediate positive feedback, or a series of progressive changes that build over time. For example, I knew that exercise would bring about positive chemical changes in my brain, but uh, it wasn't realistic for me to join a gym because I don't have time for it and I find going to the gym boring, so, it <laughs> so it's not something that I would keep doing for the rest of my life. Uh, so instead, I started running on a treadmill while watching TV, uh, watching a TV show I would have watched anyway. Uh, another thing I learned is that willpower gets drained throughout the day, so it's better to schedule something that takes willpower earlier rather than later. So I started getting up early to do those treadmill runs in the morning rather than planning to do it after work and not getting around to it. Uh, I also learned that it's better to spend money on experiences rather than on physical objects. So I started taking more trips and going to more events while I'm still driving my no-frills 11-year-old car. Uh, but the, one of the more important things I learned is that community is a huge contributor to happiness, which led me here to Sunday Assembly, where, and... <laughs> um, uh, and that uh, has worked out pretty well, and that I've met a lot of wonderful people that has had a big positive impact on my happiness. Uh, now, not all self-help books are helpful. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, in particular, there's the kind of books that say uh, you can do anything if you just try or believe hard enough. Now, these books are unrealistic uh, because 
you really can't change everything about yourself overnight. And the authors of these books really lack empathy uh, in that they have the skills of entrepreneurship and uh, confidence that allow them to become self-help gurus, but the readers don't necessarily have those skills. It would be like if LeBron James wrote a book on how to play basketball that said, just try really hard and throw the ball through the hoop. <laughs> um, you know, it's not going to work if you don't have that talent. Um, but the bigger problem with these books is that when they say you can do anything if you just try and believe hard enough, the implication there is that if you don't succeed at all of your goals, it's because you didn't try or believe hard enough, and it's your fault and you should feel like a complete loser. Um, which, if you're someone who's consulting a self-help book, it's probably because you feel like something's missing from your life and you're in a psychologically fragile state, so that can be really harmful. I know for me, reading these kinds of books really made me feel worse until I realized that it wasn't a problem with me, it was a problem with these books and their authors. Um, so I still haven't sold a screenplay, and I don't necessarily expect to, and I'm still working as an accountant. But I'm okay with that, and I've found ways to be happy. I have a wife who loves me, a community of friends, and the knowledge of how to improve my mental well-being, and that's pretty good. I'm Steve Friedman, and I'm doing my best. That's great. All right, Steve. Yeah. Steve and Steve, they're also great. Uh, well, now that you've had, uh, if you like the experience that you're, you're having, uh, that you're engaged in, if you feel that it is enriching uh, or that you're meeting a, a community that you like to keep going, I uh, would like to encourage you to uh, reach into your wallet and get ready for the collection. Uh, volunteers are going to be circulating with boxes, or if you have a, a credit card and would like to make a, a swipe, just raise your hand and... Uh, and someone will come by with a square reader. Uh, seriously, we're, we are donation-based, and we rely on your generosity uh, to help us. So we, we really appreciate all the ways you help uh, by contributing financially or as volunteers. Uh, oh, and yeah, so the cash collection that we, we collect each time at an assembly uh, almost covers uh, child care and the uh, child care supplies. And everything else, uh, we rely on... Uh, memberships primarily, so uh, thank you to our members uh, for, for making automated donations each month. And if you don't know what that is, we encourage you to check out uh, our website uh, and look into uh, membership. Normally you get a, a, a snazzy green That's right, a name green, green name tag, yeah. As well as, as some other perks. These other perks? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, once in a while, we'll have a, a, like a, something like a private JPL tour, which I think we might have someone in the audience who works at JPL and, and is willing to offer another Sunday. Oh, he's giving a donation right now. I'm going to leave that. Um, and uh, we give members first dibs at uh, signing up for those tours, which are always in oh. demand. Are you holding up a card? If there's a card reader? Okay. If you donate at the 20... $25 level or above per month, you get a, a T-shirt that you can claim uh, from us at any time. We're about to get some of those in. We've just reordered uh, for those of you waiting on sizes. Uh, and other, other perks when we can manage. But it's important to us that, uh, the, the, assem that the assembly is always free, that everyone can always come. So we, we appreciate all the ways that you give back to the community. This really is a, a volunteer-guided effort, uh, and we're in this together. Uh, and I'd like to uh, especially thank our organizers and volunteers this month where we had to do some, uh, they did some really fancy footwork and pulled all this together in, uh, you know, less time than I would have thought was humanly possible. So thank you to all of you for all your help. Yes. So thank you for our volunteers who've been going around with the boxes. Perhaps if the band wants to get into position. And uh, a couple of things while they're getting themselves ready. Uh, so the next assembly, we're going to have music from Hunter and the Dirty Jacks. People who've been here before will uh, remember them well. And they're a, 
October, Sorry, go ahead. October 14th at yep. a surprise location. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please keep in touch with us about that. Maybe back here. How did, how did this work out today? Yes, this is a really nice we'll place, take, isn't it? We'll take, we'll, we're happy for your feedback. You know, shoot, us, shoot us an email or a Absolutely. Note. And between now and then, there are lots of other things going on in the Sunday Assembly community. You can see a few pictures on the board. If you want to check out the website, you'll see them all listed. So there are a number of activities that you can get yourself involved in. All, all kinds of ways to engage and enrich your brain. Uh, and make sure you can also check out yeah, the community board and talk to Todd. We've got a couple things coming up this weekend. Uh, the Saturday social at Griffith uh, Observatory, like so. And on Sunday, Todd is organizing a trip to a virtual reality experience uh, that is uh, like a, a team, like an escape room sort of situation, and that it's a game and a maze, and it will, it is, I think, guaranteed to uh, engage your brain. Uh, <laughs> and challenge, challenge your 3D perception. Uh, so check out, uh, talk to Todd, check out the website for that. And if you'd like to join us afterwards, we're meeting at Eat This, which is just next door. And uh, if you'd like to come and have something to eat with us, please feel free to join us after the assembly. I want to clarify, it's called Eat This Cafe, but they, I believe they do not, they are not inviting us to eat the cafe. They will <laughs> uh, and it, yeah, it's table service, but they, they know to expect a big group. Let them know you're with Sunday Assembly, and, and we can, we'll sit in lots of tables near each other and do the thing that we always do. And for our final song, we're going to do a quick, do, do you want to say what, what this is about? Uh, well, this is a, in tribute to um, an amazing uh, female artist who passed away recently, Aretha Franklin. Um, so we're going we're gonna to try, and obviously, uh, you know, in our, in our humble uh, band situation, <laughs> do, it, do it some justice, but, you know, she was a great lady and an amazing uh, woman of colour, an amazing role model for women and women of colour um, all around the world. So, so if you want to get on your feet, do you want to help us uh, also want pay to some respect? a very special guest. This is Nick. Yes with the craziest last surname that I've ever seen. <laughs> I will not even try to pronounce it, um, but he is playing saxophone for the saxophone solo. So, all right, welcome Nick. Just leave it. 
Good job.